first of all, Brian, thanks for coming on the show. Much appreciated. Uh, I think you have a ton to offer the skin health community and uh, we welcome you. <laughs> thanks so much. So I first heard, from, heard about you, I believe it was a TED talk, um, but I know the name of the video is called Why We Should Be Eating more meat, not less. Uh -huh. And it was wonderful, kind of the intro that you gave. I could like hear the gasp from the crowd, a lot of plant-based people. So I'm gonna start the conversation off there. Why should people consider or just simply be eating more meat, not less? Yeah, well, we've been doing that for millions of years before we were in human. So you gotta start from the beginning. And yeah, that was actually a presentation at a food industry conference. And they had, yeah, they had a really nice production. It looked like a TED talk, but they had me t talk about, I was the only one there talking on the pro meat side. Every single presentation, everyone there was doing fake meat products, cell-based meat, plant-based meat, all this stuff. So yeah, they were not amused by me. Uh, but you know, I think it's an important message. And I think it's not just that meat is okay to eat. I wanted to say, yes, let's eat more meat, right? Because that's really what I believe. And the more I've, more animal foods I've eaten, the healthier I've got, and everyone that's around me, you know, that's, I don't know if I'm creating a little bubble, <laughs> but everyone I know eats more meat and gets better. So I think it's a really important thing <laughs> to do right. and talk about. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, conversation within that. Um, we have been eating meat for a very long time. Um, and I think, Going straight to an anecdotal place, one of your Instagram posts, I think, kind of uh, was really awesome in my opinion. And it was a side-by-side -side mm -hmm. comparison. One picture, you look like a typical guy, you know, mm -hmm. somewhat in that, and, and not to be judgmental to anyone or too focused mm -hmm. on aesthetics, but kind of had this skinny fat thing happening. For and sure. then in the picture, the after picture, it, you know, super lean, very muscular, um, and in the post, you talk about how you were working out like a wild man, hitting the gym super hard, eating a ton of plants and keeping your fats nice and low, but the results were obviously not good. Then switching over to what you call your sapien diet, it was obvious the effects that it had on you. Can you tell us about that process for you? For sure. It's so important. You can almost frame this entire discussion just on that little journey because it, it pulls in everything, right? There's the exercise part, the food part, all this stuff. So I really did follow the food, food pyramid. Now that I look back, I remember these years. So the first picture, I was 26. My face was round, kind of inflamed. I thought I was normal. I thought I was, you know, I was wearing a size 32 pants. I thought I was normal. I thought I was thin. And I wasn't, I was, you know, I had actually chronic overuse injuries from com the computer, you know, I was my, my wrists and arms, forearms and were a mess. So all these little things, you know, I get sick every three months, every, you know, all these little things where I thought I was in perfect health. I thought I was doing better than most around me. And I was doing better than most around me, but looking back, I was actually a mess. So what I was eating, I remember I was I was making all my own foods, right? I was making it from scratch. I remember this. I've always just liked to do that. So it wasn't like I was eating out and eating McDonald's, all that type of stuff. I'm, I would live the same lifestyle. And I was doing, yeah, just classic food burn. And then my workouts, I was, you know, jogging, doing all these, you know, kind of like long distance stuff. I thought cardio was, you know, the pinnacle of everything. And you had to spend an hour doing these workouts. All right. Years later, that was 10 years ago. I'm 36 now. Uh, there's more to the story of why I made these changes with my family. And we can get into this whole stuff later, the film I'm making and all, all that kind of thing. But I made these changes. I spend about 17 minutes in the gym. I, I still make all my own food. I eat way more delicious food now. I'm eating, you know, a mostly animal-based diet. The sapien diet to me is about, you know, the one that I do. I, the sapien is actually a whole framework of all good diets that work and, but my sapien little sweet spot is, is a very animal based by calories, 90% or more. Uh, I eat some fermented vegetables, you know, which I think are good and some low sugar fruit, you know, maybe some avocado, some fungus, you know, some, some f mushrooms and I'm eating delicious meals. I'm spending 17 minutes in the gym, just doing, you know, compound movements like body weight stuff or, you know, maybe with a weight vest, so more than body weight, but the same type of stuff as in dips, pull-ups, squats, 
stuff like that. And I'm feeling amazing. All those things have reversed. I wear size 28 waist now for my board shorts and, and I've put on a lot of muscle and it's, everything is better. So that's my main message. I'm just like, how, how crazy is it uh, that you can make some simple changes, but they're not about willpower. They're not about things you don't like. It's not about forcing down salads. Uh, there's just a lot there. So. Right. And I think one of the things that hit home for me with that post, and I think that a single post like that can speak volumes to, to people you don't count calories. You're pretty much putting the same effort into it, way less effort in the gym. And the results are, and I'll put up the picture during the interview. They're, they're mm. awesome. And they're obvious. Mm. Um, so kind of from my take on it, and I've, I've read through your stuff quite a bit. I could summarize it in minimizing processed foods, um, more focus on fat and protein, less on carbs. And then having somewhat of like a condensed eating window. I'm curious as to some of the details, and this is with the population that I work with and speak to, the details really help. And so mm -hmm. what they would love to know about and, and what I'd love to hear about is what's a typical day of eating and living like for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's another good way to frame all of this, right? Yeah, it's just how, how, how do I live? I, well, I go to sleep later, so I don't think it's important what time you sleep, but I always get eight hours of sleep, right? And I think a lot of people get into crazy gadgets and gizmos, and that's probably good, you know, to focus on. But step one is allowing for enough sleep. It's prioritizing it. I remember for years, I was, I just wanted to stay up late and hang out with my friends. And then you know, I get six and a half hours of sleep and then you're just tired all day. But I, I could have, it's not like I was getting bad sleep, right? So first of all is prioritize sleep and then you can refine it and make your sleep better. I think sleep is huge, right? So, so get your sleep. Then I like to just wake up. I'm not going to eat any calories into lunch. So I'm just, you know, doing my work around the house and I have a stand up desk and yeah, I'm, I'm not eating until maybe 1 PM. So I actually get sun. I get, and I go out in the sun, I think is important. I go out and lay out wherever you can and read a book, listen to a book, listen to a podcast, take a phone call. I get, uh, I'm up to 20 minutes per side. Uh, you know, I do my front and then back. So 40 minutes total. I mean, people might start it lower than that. You don't want to burn. And I think vitamin D is a huge getting, you know, we, we were, we are homo sapiens. We are people who roam the earth and we were outside and we were not in offices. So, the sun is huge. And then I, I do lunch. I do a big meal. I, I have this theory that humans want to eat to, till they're full. Like these whole thing, like, oh, let's calorie count. Let's restrict our portions. Let's, let's have like five small meals. I don't like that. Like, I think we want to eat until we are full. And the best way that I found is doing two meals a day. Because I think one meal a day is great for some people. But maybe that's too much food at once. But and three meals, I think, is too many meals because it's kind of hard. Unless you're a very uh, active person, you're probably going to get too many calories if you eat to satiety three times. So I do two meals. So I'll stop there. If, if you have any <laughs> questions or comments, yeah, what I'm curious to what a typical meal looks like for you. And I, I'm I'm of the you know on, on the channel we speak a lot about you know give yourself some time each day to not be digesting and eating food. It takes a lot of energy. And um, when you're hungry, eat until you're fully satisfied. And then if you need to repeat, do so. Um, and so it's, it's I'm, the more people I talk to, the more people that are having success, we're kind of reflecting similar values and how we eat and live. I'm curious of the details though. Like what That's people want to know is, what the hell is Brian actually eating? Okay, he eats whole foods, he eats a lot of bioavailable proteins and fats, but what does a typical meal look like for you? Yeah, sure. So I have, well, I have a company called Nose to Tail, if I can throw that in. So I eat that meat there, it's nosetail.org, but it's, it's grass finished meat from a farm in Texas and we and ship I it out. And I can interrupt you and give a quick plug. I've been doing the 50-50 ground beef blend and it's mm. absolutely bomb. And I found out about that 
I think from watching that same video where I found you, I, I mm. you know, I, I looked up nose to tell and tons of great products, tons of great resources for people who are keto, carnivore, paleo, primal. So um, just to uh, reiterate to you and make you not sound like you're just trying to sell your, sell your <laughs> it works. It's great. It's hard to find a 50, 50 blend of meat too. Yeah. Yeah. It's exact. It's basically kind of like Wagyu. It's like, you don't need to have Wagyu. All you need to do is grind up enough fat into the beef and it, it is like a Wagyu burger. Yeah. So I would definitely do that. We also have primal ground beef that I, I think that's important. You can find this elsewhere. You can do it yourself too. You don't have to get it from me, but it has the organs mixed in, right? It has kidney, heart, liver, and spleen mixed in. You, you know, you don't taste it. So I think organ meats are great. So if I'm not eating like a, a, primal ground beef patty i would you know maybe eat some liver after after the meal so so i like to do the, just a simplest meal like a very standard lunch is what i actually just ate is yeah like a, a at least half pound big patty and then i have some like pasture raised cheese put it on it so i i can do dairy i know that's a whole nother topic but especially if you know if you're getting raw stuff if you can get some raw dairy i think it's great so I got the patty as my base with the cheese. Maybe I'll do a couple slices of bacon on the side. Maybe I had some leftover brisket. So I, 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 slow, I have a big brisket with the fat on it, all the, the whole, t the point, I think it's called. And I slow cooked it and then I cut it up. You can put it in the freezer, right? Now I have all these containers of, of brisket that I can pop out whenever I want and have like this delicious fatty meat. You know, it could just even be a side dish. I could just, I just spread some of this brisket on the burger uh, on the top. And then I will probably have an egg. Like I, I get, you know, ha Happy Eggs is a great product. I don't know if they have those around the country. I just see them at grocery stores here in Los Angeles. And you could go to the farmer's market. Definitely recommend going to the farmer's market. I think eggs are one of the number one things to do to get pasture raised. Get the best eggs possible. It's the best bang for your buck. Like, you know, I mean, just that there's a huge difference. You can look at when, when you start getting those orange yolks and you know, you've tasted it, your body knows that your eyes know it. Like that's, that's a real deal. So I found that happy eggs you can actually get in regular stores and are, are really great. So I'll have one or two of those on the side. And then I just figure whatever I have in the fridge, whatever I have in the, in the cupboard, I just add some sides, just some of these you know, fermented sides. I think they have, you know, there's this probiotic thing. They have vitamin C, like all these fermented foods have a lot of vitamin C in them. They have, uh, I don't know, they just have flavor variety. So I know, uh, that, you know, there's this whole thing, should we go completely carnivore? You know, depending on your situation, there's a lot of factors, but I encourage people to, you know, maybe see if some fermented vegetables fit into your, your diet, because they can't, but then there's like histamine problems, you know? So maybe you could tell me more about that after about, you know, skin stuff and, and histamines, but I do the, uh, the, the fermented side, sauerkraut, kimchi, stuff like that. And then maybe some avocado, but I, and, or mushrooms and onions. Um, I guess the onions is, is the biggest curveball uh, because some people, you know, they're like, well, that's maybe there's some, I don't know. I don't see a huge problem with onions and, uh, I just, I've kind of zoned in on those things, those pl certain plant foods that I think have, again, most bang for your buck. Like I'm all, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. It's all about efficiency. It's all about uh, effectiveness. And if I, if I get those, they taste good to me. You, you can have them around easily. It's like, you just have a jar of sauerkraut. You have a jar of this jar of pickles, make your own I'm talking to a guy right now about fermenting my own stuff. Uh, I, I just think that that's great. So I'll stop there for lunch. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I think, I think the take home there, and for anyone who wants to see what some of your dishes look like, go to his Instagram. Um, Brian has mm -hmm. posted a bunch of his meals. And I think that a big part of kind of what you're doing, maybe compared to someone like Michaela Peterson, who's pretty much water, beef, and salt, um, is that it's a very hyper palatable way to eat a carnivore based diet. And I think that for the population that I work with, there's so much individualization that needs to happen. And you eloquently said it, try some stuff out, see what works for you. Uh, I know for me, certain plants work great that don't work for other people and, and certain plants that don't work for me work for other people. So 
but the take home is there's a lot of bioavailable fats and proteins on your dish in your dishes plus some plant foods that work well for you that really make it palatable give you some extra mouthfeel curious from your experience and opinion um what would you say are some of the most important animal foods to try to incorporate on a weekly or daily basis? Yeah, I think there's, there's three, the three main ones are just the organ meats and those could be weird for people and not everyone likes them. And so you can hide them. There's a way you can get raw liver, you can freeze it and cut it up a little bit and you can just like swallow it. Sometimes I'll even put it in bone broth after a meal, I'll drink some bone broth and you can just float little bees of liver in it and you just kind of suck it down. Mm -hmm. So organ meats are huge, number one, huge. And then I think the seafoods, just like these nutrient dense seafood things. Like I go to this Japanese store uh, pretty often and just get these interesting seafoods. I mean, there's fish eggs, there's oysters. I get these raw oysters that come in this little jar that are on ice and, you know, you're getting so many different nutrients there. And a lot of people, yeah, these Michaela Peterson types, I, I don't know. I mean, I've had a lot of debates with Dr. Sean Baker and he's, you know, even with, we did one with Mark Sisson and Paul Saladino and we did the whole thing. Yeah. About, just got done talking to Paul about an hour ago. Yep. That's great. Yeah. Well, he, he came up to LA and we did this thing with us four in a studio and you can find that on YouTube, but it was like, one of the topics was, do you need to eat nose to tail? And Sean Baker's just like, Hey, I don't think they taste good. I've never liked it. I don't think our ancestors like it that i don't know he's just making you know c conjecture that maybe if normal people nowadays don't like them that maybe we always didn't like them and it's kind of the same argument he makes against like kale and broccoli it's like they're they don't taste good they maybe they're not necessary but uh i think it's how you're raised and that i have you know a friend that's from russia or his family's from russia and he loves it his favorite that he just loved to eat liver so i think it's, it's really contextual like that so uh, but yeah, but the same thing with the, with the seafood, you know, get these oysters, get, get the fish eggs. The fish eggs have tons of bio, bioavailable DHA. It's like the best way to get DHA, uh, I believe. And even some seaweeds, you know, I, 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 maybe I grew up in Hawaii, so I'm used to sort of these different Asian foods and I think seaweed has some good things in it, right? Some iodine and some other things. So I just think it's, it's to get this whole spectrum of nutrients is better in the long term. Everything we do is kind of based on your current theories, right? And what you think is best at the moment. And, you know, that's probably going to change. And, but my, one of my current theories, I'm almost like hedging my bets, right? Where I'm, I'm, I do want a little bit of plant foods. I do want that vitamin C. I do want maybe a tiny bit of fiber. I don't think fiber is necessary exactly, but it's like, oh, maybe there is something to it or maybe some in, you know, some soluble fiber to, there, there, there could be something there. So I, I like to hedge my bets that I'd like to get this full nutrient thing, but many people like, you know, Paul does it sometimes or, or the nose, just like the muscle meat guys like Sean Baker will just be like, Hey, I'm feeling great and I don't need it. And maybe, you know, we have things wrong about vitamin C or you don't need this much calcium or selenium or magnesium or potassium or all these things. So I don't know. What do, what do you think? <laughs> I, I mean, I agree. I, I think that, you know, when it gets down to the micro and macro nutrients from a scientific data standpoint and an ancestral historical standpoint, I think that um, it can be very confusing for people. It can be um, challenging to wrap your brain around who's right and who's wrong and, and the whole debate. And I don't think that we necessarily need to do that. I think it's listen to different perspectives and be your own person. Try things out, see what feels right for you. And also maybe someone who has the perspective of Dr. Sean Baker, who I've you know, had the chance to really talk shop with a lot too, he's doing what works best for him in a sustainable way. So I think what he's saying is like, mm -hmm. I'm never gonna eat broccoli on a regular basis, nor am I gonna eat liver. So I'm not gonna promote it, nor am I gonna worry about it. I'm going to do what I can sustain. And I think there's some, some awesomeness within that. For me personally, I just feel better and I find it much easier to sustain super clean eating when I have a little bit of options and when there's a little bit of different texture and mouthfeel. And I don't know anything. All I know is the data my body provides for me through experimentation 
And what I found is that a mostly bioavailable diet works the best for me. There are some carbohydrates that work really good too. There are some plant foods that work really good too. So for me, it's just a lot easier and a lot more fun to pick and choose from all the things I know work with some ideas of, okay, I know that about most of my calories and most of my micro and macronutrients are coming from animals. And that's kind of the basis. And then the rest is kind of, what am I feeling like? What's available? You know, when I'm in California, when I'm in San Diego, when my friends go out and catch wild fish and bring them back and we eat them raw and eat it, eat it, you know, on a barbecue that day, I'm going to eat a lot of fish. And when I'm in the Midwest and I can get my hands on amazing steaks and filet mignon and, and wonderful, wonderful beef, I'm going to eat a lot of beef. So I kind of let where I'm at dictate and I, I like to have some differentiation in my, my palate. Um, and, uh, but I, I fully agree with you. I think that there is nuance to this whole thing. Um, and there's a lot of different kind of ways to, to peel the onion, if you will. Yeah. Well, humans are super opportunistic. You know, that's what we did. We, we exploited the environment for what it had and it was varying. And, I think maybe that would be my criticism of a Sean Baker type diet is it doesn't vary enough because we don't know exactly what we ate for all of history, but we don't, we know it's not the same thing every day. And, yeah, you know, for sure. That is, that is an yeah. undebatable fact is that our ancestral yeah. humans, they were not eating lean beef and salt only. No chance. We know that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's interesting, but, and then, yeah, I love the, the, uh, long, like, how am I going to do this long-term? Like that's huge. And maybe, I guess that is for Sean that it's just a simplicity. Although I have seen him post a lot of fish. He just like went yeah. through a few meals of just crazy amounts of fish and like yak butter or something. I so, saw that too. And I, it made me laugh because he always does. Anytime he eats something other than beef, he's always like, see, I'm, I'm eating some fish <laughs> now. It's just funny. Yeah. With that kind of, this might be a decent segue. Um, one of the things, and, and I do want to get into this quite a bit because I find it a fascinating topic because I'm a former vegan myself, uh, mm. reformed ex-vegan, you might say. There's a lot of, I don't want to go so far as to say propaganda, but there's misinformation out there. And one of the things that you hear constantly, and Sean Baker is one of the guys who speaks against this, is feedlot meat. You know, you'll get the claims that it's so unhealthy and then red meat in general is just, it's going to destroy your heart. It's going to be extremely inflammatory. You're going to get mm -hmm. cancer. What is the evidence that you've found talking about those subjects? Yeah. So separate subjects, but the red meat in general is super interesting because I got to talk to one of the scientists, the PhD from the USDA who was on the panel for the WHO in 2015 that decided that meat was a carcinogen mm -hmm. and you know that's where all this comes from this is just this one panel that decided this and there's he said they were mostly vegetarian a lot of vegan vegetarians they're very biased they did not it was obvious to him he he's not like a carnivore by any stretch he's like a very down the middle of the road guy he's you know this old white dude just is like I like meat and potatoes and balance and eat your fiber. You know, he's not like a, a crazy person, but he's like, meat is not a bad. I have all these studies. They would not look at all the studies that he presented. They chose to use a lot of epidemiology. They chose to ignore things. So just know that that's what went on. And now we're stuck with that. So there, there is no good science showing that it's harmful in any way. Uh, what we do know in our community is that it's very, very likely and almost can be proven with some epidemiology that it's what else you're eating, not the meat, right? It's the combination of people. Most people don't just eat meat like we do. They're eating, this is super obvious to people, they're eating meat with uh, you know, hamburger buns and fries and milkshakes and the whole thing. Everyone knows this. It's what else you're eating. All these people that we're studying, like w just think of how many people that have been studied in the in these epidemiology studies that eat meat in response a good way. It's like less than one percent. I mean, we ha our communities haven't even been around that long, right. right? So these people are not being studied. Everyone who's eating meat is eating grains, 
sugars, all these other things with the meat. Right. And epidemiology studies, they're, they're so kind of, I, I don't really like them because really the point of an epidemiology, epidemi, I can't even say the word now, those mm -hmm. types of studies are meant to create data so that then we can test theories. And when we focus on things of that nature, most of them come from surveys and they're asking people to use their memory to talk about what foods they've eaten in the past or, or enjoy eating in general. And working with the, the, the basically the, the clients that I do, I run, a, run into this all the time. Okay, tell me about your diet. Oh, I eat super clean and healthy. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Don't change your diet at all. Write down everything that you eat in detail for one whole week, and then we'll get back together and have a conversation. And when the facts of, and the data really start to be on paper, um, you start to see there's red flags everywhere. Okay, yeah, you're having some salmon, but you also had an ice cream cone. You also had you know, a Snickers bar, and you had like cereal for breakfast every single morning, but it was the salmon, it was the animal product that you're, that you're most worried about. Hmm. Also, you know, many of the studies, they focus on, okay, what do you remember eating? And they don't ask how much they work out. Do they intermittent fast? Do they ever get cold? Do they ever get hot? So there's, there's a, a lot more to the argument than, than meets the eye, in my opinion. Yeah, well, they actually did a study to show that the, uh, there is a healthy user bias. That yeah. they, did, you know, they did look back and they found that the people who you know, said they eat less meat, they also did all these other healthy behaviors because we were told they're good. So these are the people who smoke less, drink less, and exercise more. So we've even studied that. And then also a great study that everyone should know about is that 88% of Americans are metabolically unwell. So this just proves that the vast, vast majority of people are not doing well. So it's insane to study them. Right, right. I, I think it'll be interesting as, you know, the, the carnivore diet or the kind of nutrient dense bioavailable diets um, are being eaten longer by people um, who are also doing the other stuff, you know, like me and you and uh, where you're eating clean, but you're also moving your body, getting the sunlight, maybe doing some form of stress management, um, having a healthy, holistic approach. Okay, now let's study what meat's actually doing to us on a, on a deep scientific level. And I, I think that it's going to be, you know, pretty eye-opening for most people as, as studies kind of come out and grow. Hmm. Absolutely. That's, that's, so I call all of these diets the sapien diet. I, I'm not trying to say my, my little way of eating is like a subset of the sapien diet, but I'd love if there was this terminology like the vegans, vegetarians, at least they have a label that they can be studied. But if we can get hopefully this label that, that a carnivore, keto, you know, paleo, these are all sapien. If we can study that, I think that'd be great. And yeah, I, I think that we're going to learn so much more. It's going to be so different. And th this is when we can finally understand the difference between grass fed and grain fed. So this kind of transitions to your next study, because if we finally take out all these other variables, which are super confounding, we can get to the core of this. And I definitely believe that grass fed is better. Like that's almost guaranteed that it's better. But the, the real question is how much better and do we need to, it's like, should I not eat a single bite of grain fed beast or I'm going to die? Or is it just like whenever, you know, it, we just know grass fed is better and do it whenever you can and focus on it. So that, that's the next topic. And I think there's a big debate on that. I'm trying to learn that. And I try to talk to people daily. I, I've talked to over 150 people, scientists, doctors, researchers, you know, making a film this is all I do. And I still haven't got to the, the bottom of it exactly. Because every time I think it's one thing, then I hear something else. So I'll, I'll just say it's fantastic for your, the environment, right? We definitely want to support regenerative agriculture, cows on grass, number one. And it, there definitely is a difference with the omega-6, omega-3 ratio. So grass is definitely better. But then is where I can't be so sure. And there's these smaller details. And the more I, I talk to, you know, people who follow me on Instagram, mostly there's a lot of farmers out there, a lot of great people who are, who are saying, you know, if I say something against, say, grain-fed beef, or, or, you know, they, they will say, hey, guess what? I raise my animals well. And I am technically considered, you know, feedlot beef. You know, you can buy my meat at the grocery store, but 
I'm doing everything well. I, you know, like the animals are cared for, they're on grass for most of their life. We do feed them, you know, we grow some hay or whatever. It's not hay, uh, you know, we, we have some of these grasses and stuff that they eat during the cold months or, you know, just how, how it ends up working is a lot different than you think. And that they, so they, they say also that this idea of the feedlots is not what you think either. I'm sure there are some like giant, crazy, bad feedlots. But really, I, I've you know looked at this enough to know that that's not the case, and I certainly know they're not what the vegans characterize them as is in cages, and that they're not locked up for their whole life. Like cows are, you know, in. I mean, maybe they're on dirt and they're they're kind of packed in, but they like to be packed in for one thing. They're social animals, and they have plenty of space, and they're not in cages. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's a perfect segue to kind of my next question is. The environmental and humane debate, and, and one of the things from the video that I first found you with that struck me, and I've been using this as ammo for mm -hmm. ever since, is 25 times more sentient beings die or murdered <laughs> from growing plants and crops. Um, and one of the arguments that the plant-based and vegan community really just, they, they push so hard is that it's more sustainable, it's better for the environment, and it's more humane. And I'd love to hear you kind of address that with facts oh, yeah. and your experience. Yeah, I mean, you, those all three break down. That's kind of what my presentation was on. And I did another one recently So on each of those. So those three arguments all break down. So we kind of broken down the nutritional side. Yeah. Right. So, and people probably know all the nutrition stuff anyway. Right. I have to explain that to that crowd that you saw because they had no idea about the nutrition, but then the environment the ethics is, is more nuanced. It's difficult. So the ethics, well, yeah, this is the ethical side. So we'll do ethics first because it's, we're talking about creatures dying. And so that was a study out of Australia mm -hmm. and that um, when they got that 25 times number and I almost went to Australia actually uh, before this all happened. You know, we're kind of on lockdown right now, but yeah. I was going to go to uh, Australia and Africa and spend some time with like the Maasai and the Hadza. And I got an invitation out there, which would, I think is going to be amazing. And I can't wait. But there are so many deaths, whether their animals are chopped up in the combines or whether they're starved. A lot of people don't understand that there's all these, all the animals rely on these corn wheat and soy they eat it and then now when you wipe it out none of their food is there so they die of starvation so that was an interesting one i never thought about mm -hmm. is it's, it's not it's not like there's millions getting actually chopped up there's millions getting they starved or they're getting the pesticides or you know there's all these other secondary and you know tertiary even results of these monocrops plants so of course, the, the vegan crowd will try to deny that, or maybe they'll say, well, well, these are smaller animals. They have all ways of justifying it, but I love the kind of argument that, well, when would, what, which life is more important? And, you know, how do you care? How do you like, has there a hierarchy? Because if you were a carnivore, you could survive on one or two animals the entire year. Exactly. And so what, what are you going to say to that when there's no way that that is anywhere close to what happens with the most cleanest vegan even if a vegan there's only so much you can grow in your yard and even if you're growing stuff in your yard you're killing animals you have to manage snails you have to manage these insects or they're going to take up uh, they're going to eat all your food so there really is no argument with the the death count right i i, I think that's super super interesting and and um, you know and this isn't to become a anti-vegan message at all. And, mm -hmm. and I have, you know, respect for people who have a, have a spiritual or a, a, just an inner connection to, they don't want to, they don't, for them, not eating meat allows them to feel a deeper connection, um, more, more loving. And if that's mm -hmm. you, do your thing. But I think both the plant-based and vegan community and the non-plant-based communities will do better by really talking about facts and, and the less propaganda everyone uses, the better it's actually going to help humanity. And I also think that a segue is kind of like, okay, let's talk a little bit about sustainability. And when you look at farming practices, um, monocropping versus 
um, cyclical and cycling um, your crops and cycling where you pasture and even cycling the types of animals that you might use. Can you speak on what is more sustainable, what you found through your research and, and kind of uh, just address that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's so many ways to do this. I mean, there, I've talked to a lot of great people like Alan Savory, who's a kind of a world leader in this, and he calls it holistic farming, yeah. right? So it's, it, there's no one way to do it. And that's interesting to me because I thought, you know, oh, let's everyone just do rotational grazing. I heard of this thing called rotational grazing. When we all do it, it's like, well, there's people up in the north that you can't do that. And that every single climate's different. And I also uh, have been lucky enough to visit a lot of these farms, shooting the film, Food Lies. And I, you know, I went to Joel Salatin's place in Virginia. Very lush, you know, tons of rain. And that's a great place for rotational grazing. And to explain what that is, is you have, instead of just letting them all loose in a big field, you can move them. You, you use simple things like this uh, electric wire that will corral them, which mimics nature. You know, these are herd animals that were moving across the plains in, in tight packs. And so they eat a bit of the grass in one paddock, and then you move them to the next paddock the next day. And then that stimulates the grass. It you get them right at the right time where it, they get the most nutrient dense. That there's a there's a, actually a X a cross section of the time that it's how long the grass gets to like how nutrient you know the nutrients and you get it right at the cross section and then you move them on. And if you go in a circle, if you can imagine, you break up this large field into a system of paddocks using simple wire. Then they come back around, and when they by the time the cows get uh, cattle get back around the grass is ready to be grazed again. And you can even run chickens behind that and they could, you know, all their manure and all these things are adding to the soil. This is why regenerative farming works is it puts carbon back in the soil. So there's, there's many more details to it, but it's basically doing, you know, using these strategies to keep all the manure, the urine, using different animals and rotating them in a way makes this all work, puts carbon back in the soil. But then, you know, you have to do something else differently in Africa. And, you know, Alan Savory talks about desertification and how you need the, the animals and the land there. And it's a whole different system, but it's really just people doing, you know, the math and, and doing the planning to make it work. And it, there's a version of this that can work in any, any ecosystem. That's, that's awesome. With um, your film, Food Lies, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, kind of the focus of it. I think obviously people might get the focus based on what we're talking about, but mm -hmm. I'd like to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, what led you to wanting to make this film, how shooting is going and just kind of a, a nice little overview of what it's going to be like. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what it's going to be, it changed really. I, I think I, I'm glad it's been taken so long because it's gotten better. We've gotten more interviews, more amazing scope. So it's not like this crazy, like you got to be carnivore, keto, low carb, or you're going to die type of film. We're taking a look at what humans should eat. That's the biggest question. What should humans eat? Why is this so complicated? Right? Like why? I was using an example of like, you go to a, a grocery store, you look at these magazine racks. Like one of them is like low fat and one's high fat. You know, it's opposite. Eggs, bad. Eggs, good. Butter's bad. Butter's good. And then the same magazine will do the opposite the next month. Right? It's so conflicting. It's like even the same magazine will tell you the exact same informa opposite information the next month. Why is this? Well, we're exploring this, right? So we, we want to look at the entire story of how humans evolved. Why did we need animal foods? So it almost tracks the presentation, really. If you find my thing on YouTube, there is somewhat of a story arc of like, let's start at the beginning and find out how humans evolved, right? Why, why was animal food, why were animal foods so important to humans? What, what did that change? What, what changes in our body and our guts, right? Our guts changed, our brains grew bigger, our, our jaws changed. I've talked to so many great anthropologists, archeologists and people talking about this. And here's a little side story about nutrient density, bioavailability and, and humans is Dr. Bill Schindler, a great guy that we got in the film. He talks about how humans process food outside of the body. So that's, that refutes a lot of these vegan arguments because they're like, oh, well, why don't you have claws? Why don't we have fangs? Like, they, they, I get these comments. It's so funny. They're like, why don't you, if, if meeting, eating meat's so good, why don't you go 
you know, jump on a cow and start eating them with your face. And it's just, it's such a stupid argument. You know, that's, that's, doesn't mean anything like why we're human. Homo habilis is, is a tool user. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Our answer is like, that does, that's how we evolved. We got here by using to, tools and our ingenuity. So we, and that changed our bodies. So we process food outside of the body, whether that be cooking meat, killing it, hunting it. Uh, but also all these preparation techniques of plant foods. So that's how this sort of fermented foods kind of comes into play is humans understood that these vegetables had toxins in them. They had anti-nutrients in them. They had bad things. So they wouldn't eat them straight. They would either not eat them at all. You know, most plants they don't eat, but if they did eat these plants, they would ferment, sprout, soak, whatever. They've all around the world, people have figured out throughout history and in current day, you know, this guy, Dr. Bill Schindler still goes around visiting tribes and seeing how they do. And there's all these ways to, even with potatoes, they, they'll ferment them and stick them underground for weeks to get, get some of these lectins and other anti-nutrients out of them. They do all kinds of things because they know that there's harmful things. And I think why there's a carnivore community and why so many people need to go to an extreme you know, it's a pretty restrictive if you're I mean, Michaela Peterson. But I, I, part of the, the, the reason is because no one prepares the animal foods proper or plant foods properly, right? They, yeah. There's so much going on there. Even, even just a modern fruit is, is messed up in a, because we made it so sweet. We genetically engineered it. So it's, it's everything we've done. So this is the, the recap that Bill Schindler says. All, throughout all of history, processing of food, increased nutrient density. In the modern environment, all processed food has decreased nutrient density, right? It's the exact opposite. All it is is shoving in corn, oil, wheat, you know, so all these seed oils, uh, refined grains, and sugar. So that's what modern food, process, food processing is. So that was kind of a little sidetrack from the main story is, but we, we tell this story, right? This is a story kind of a Weston Price. I don't know if you talk about Weston Price a lot. I do. Okay, good. <laughs> he's, you know, great guy. Just, uh, I won't go over it again, but it, he's part of that story. You know, this, yeah. this, the flowers, seed oils and sugars is what ruined all these native populations. And we go through the history of, of the uh, agricultural revolution, right? And how our our brains got smaller, we got shorter, we were less robust, we had more disease. This all happened when we started eating all these grains and we settled down with agriculture. So we, so we moved from the, the distant ancient evolution up to the agricultural revolution, up all the way into why did we start thinking meat was bad? There's a great guy, Dr. Gary Fetke over in Australia, you know, tells this whole story of, you know, the Seventh-day Adventists and the demonization of meat. We're going into the, then starting in the 1900s when we got all the industrial seed oils and, you know, big money and food corporations started getting in the mix. And then the, you know, we, Ansel Keys is a classic story of why we thought the cholesterol was bad. <laughs> yeah. Saturated fat. So we, yeah, this was before. So in the 50s, 60s, this all started yeah. and then, and we, we got this saturated fat and cholesterol wrong. And there's all these, we, we didn't even have a lot of the scientific you know, equipment or experiments to even do the proper science back then. So then 1980 comes along, we have these dietary guidelines. And ever since then, you can look at these graphs. It's, it's a nightmare. It's just obesity, chronic disease shoots up from there. And then, I mean, I guess I can just power through the rest. I mean, then it's, so we have this bad science and we have the new science. So I think that's a huge, important story of what, what have we learned since? Like this, this has all only come out in the last 10 years, really. Like people have been studying ketogenic diets and low carb diets and all this kind of thing only in the past 10 years. So there's tons of new science that the general public doesn't know about. And then we're getting into, so what should we eat? Like, how should we, let, let, let's explain this. Like there's this kind of thing where both, different diets can work. You know, and it's like, why does a vegan diet produce weight loss, but a carnivore diet produce weight loss when they're opposite? Well, there's a unifying theme is that it's all whole foods and that uh, the vegan diet is, is not the correct way to do it, but it's, it's kind of forcing yourself almost into the starvation state because you can't even get enough nutrients and calories. Right. But, uh, I want to explain these things in the film and I want to explain them now to, to anyone's listening. It's, 
you know, it's, it's, I, there are other diets that can work. I mean, you can eat a pescatarian diet and be pretty plant-based and still be pretty healthy. I don't know about long-term and I don't think you're going to be as healthy as someone eating a, you know, sapien diet, like an animal-based diet, but you can eat, if you're eating like oysters and liver and fish, and then you're eating, you know, safe plant foods, you're eating tubers and whatever fruits and vegetables that are prepared properly, I, I, that's fine with me. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to promote it, but I understand it. That right. you're right. You're not. You're you're eating a whole foods diet. You're not eating sugars, refined grains, and oils. You're not. You, you know. You're not eating fast food, but you're just going on the opposite end of the spectrum. So really, I'm doing this hand thing. If people are watching, on, if this goes on YouTube, that people you, you can go work on either side. There's like a fan, and either side can work. The people are stuck in the middle. Most of America, the 88% of metabolic and old people are stuck in the middle, eating high fat and high carb at the same time, all the processed foods. Which so, is the root of all evil, in my opinion. Of, if you're going to yep. take away and one thing from this. A diet that's mm -hmm. rich in both sugars and fat will destroy you and cause so much harm to your body that it's, it's even if you're eating all whole foods, you're going crazy with a ton of fat and a ton of sugar from fruit, from carbs, whatever, you're, you're going to run into some major issues. Exactly. Yeah, it's good to point out. If the only way... Okay, it's funny that people try to make it work, and those are the people in the middle who are doing all the calorie counting, and you know they're these people who and and I mean it doesn't work long term, and it also it, it's very unnatural because you're tr trying to eat like just enough calories. Like maybe if you restrict enough, you won't, but it doesn't work like that normally, right? Right. right. Yes. And I think it's uh, something that you hit on, or as you were kind of explaining the film, which I'm I'm super excited for that to come out. I think it's. I think it's going to be super beneficial, interesting, and it's going to really clear things up for a lot of people. I know from my experience, um, I was vegan for a very long time, eight years, and I went to the vegan diet after really figuring out for myself that the way I was going to get over the issues that were really plaguing my life was to catabolize the shit out of myself. Um, without starving myself. So I, I knew that when I water fasted, something drastic changed in my body. And I was like, how can I mimic that with a diet? And with the vegan approach, it worked until it didn't. Once the catabolization of the things stopped and my body weight and my hormones and my teeth and all of these things that were related to not getting the right nutrients or nutrients really at all started hitting me, um, it was an easy, easy thing to fix. And for a lot of people that I work with who are still under the veil of, oh my God, meat is bad, it's gonna hurt you. I have plenty of vegan clients who come to me suffering and all they do is add butter and eggs and it's like their whole life changes. Mm -hmm. I know for me, when I went from strict vegan, all whole foods, doing the food combining, doing all the things you're supposed to do, um, and going on kind of a keto carnivore style diet, it was absolutely life-changing. 35 pounds of muscle gained in a year, body fat didn't change, hormones were a whole new world for me. Um, my GH, my testosterone, noticeably more balanced, um, strength, uh, mental focus, sex drive, I think I mentioned that twice because it was really mm -hmm. awesome. Um, but it, I think for a lot of people, it's about, um, the experience um, and kind of, you know, opening yourself up to let's, let's not have any dogma and why don't you just find out for yourself by doing some trial and error. Yeah, that's huge. That's what I'm trying to, to promote. It's trying to be anti-dogmatic. Like I have people I don't agree with on the podcast and talk to them and maybe I'll learn something from them, you know, maybe, I'll, or maybe I'll reinforce my views because I see where they're going and I'm like well but I know that you know where you're wrong in this so I think it's important to yeah keep learning and keep experiencing things and even just the, the butter you're talking about the people that just added in the butter and the eggs that's another kind of Weston Price thing he did some studies with these people who had terrible nutrient deficiencies in some of these really poor places and all he did he split them up into two groups and one group got a uh, cod liver oil with grass-fed butter and the and you know that's just all the fat soluble vitamins and it was just a game changer. Yeah, 
Yeah, I've, 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 I love Weston Price's approach because he, he really went to that ancestral place of let's study people who've been doing something for a while, mess with what they're doing and see what happens. And I also love the reversal effect where, you know, you take someone on an ancestral diet, um, give them modern grains and sugars and watch their health deteriorate and their teeth get all messed up and almost their jaws deform and then boom, let's put them right back on their ancestral foods. And in a very short amount of time, huge improvements and pretty much back to normal and totally fine again. And so I think that it's really amazing the, the human biome and, and the, what we can actually overcome with addressing our lives with food and lifestyle. I think it's, that's kind of the whole cornerstone of my whole message. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've seen it firsthand too. There's actually a Maasai guy who was, I did a presentation in Long Beach and he came after, I mentioned the Maasai. He's like, Hey, I'm Maasai. He had amazing teeth, amazing jaw, tall, just so healthy. And he talked about, uh, he, he visited back home in, in Kenya semi recently and said that the people who started letting the modern foods creep in, they get all the flour, sugar, oil, you know, processed foods, they were doing poorly, right? Especially you see this, like you're saying, is when you get someone, a population who's not used to these foods and they're used to their natural diet and very quickly they can decline because they're just not used to it. And some people think a lot of the problem today is people think, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're well adapted to these grains or, you know, some people can handle it longer than others or better than others. So we can tolerate all these processed foods better than others, but it catches up with them. It's no one's really immune to these. I don't think it's, and that, you know, some people, it, it usually happens if when you're hit 30 too. A lot of these people who think there's, it's the problem with the vegan movement. A lot of them are young. You know, it's like, okay, talk to me when you're 35, you know, it's going to catch yeah. up to you. Like that's when it happened for me. I was 30 that, you know, things went, started going South. I was like, wait a second. Uh, yeah, I, I can't, you know, eat like I used to. So. Exactly. Exactly. So as we kind of close up the conversation today, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'd love to give you a chance to let the audience know where they can connect with you and find your work and, and hear your message. And if you could give just a, a closing, just a, a tidbit of a little golden nugget for the skin health sufferers out there um, about food, um, that would be an awesome way to close things. Sure. Yeah. I'm on Instagram mostly, food lies, food dot lies. You can search any social media platform on food lies. On YouTube, I'm trying to get more videos out there. We're doing highlights from the film, doing stuff like that. And sapien.org is just a place to go. You can find out all kinds of stuff. And we're trying to do programs and a lot of things. So, knows the tail.org uh, as well. Oh, knows the tail.org. Yeah. You can find that on sapien. Yeah. So, knows the tail.org, sapien.org foodlies.org actually i got all the dot orgs and nice. how nonprofit of you yeah <laughs> well i'm trying to be an organization i'm really trying to just get our community together and cool. yeah it's like hey we're in this together let's do this um skin health i you know I, I i've had skin problems my whole life really and so i i've been dealing with it and it, it is a lot of trial and error and it yeah i mean it's it's not easy to, you know, be mindful. You may have to track. I mean, I'm sure you have more strategies than I do, but I think it's really important to, to be really mindful of what you're eating and track it and then be okay with experimenting. Cause I'm still experimenting myself. And I think, you know, once in a while on the weekend, I'll have some food that I wouldn't normally have. And then, you know, my skin will be a little red and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out too. So I guess just, just keep tracking and, and really it's always around a processed food. I guess that's my, my one thing is, is the more to the whole food side you go, the, the better it'll be. And then, you know, keep tweaking from there. Awesome. Awesome. So I really appreciate you coming on the show, Brian, uh, best of luck with just this crazy time, your film, all of your mm -hmm. projects. And um, just in closing, I just want to reflect kind of what you just said. And because it's a, it is super important, have a journal, write down what you're eating. And in reality, it's about having data that's non-biased to look at and being honest about the results that you're getting and then make refinements. And we're all going to do much better starting from a place of whole foods. And I'll take it a step further with the clients I've worked with, with the people like you that I've talked to, 
having a bioavailable animal-based focus will cut out years of experimentation for most of you guys. So that's a great place to start for many people. Brian, thanks so much again um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Good luck out there, man. All right. Thanks so much. I love it.